Yeah. yeah. We're going to call this. Order we're going to call the committee of the whole meeting to order. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. um, roll call, and I'm just, I wrote the names on. Hannah. Here. Decker. Here. Boo. Here. Kittleson. Here. Bob. Here. Montemayor. Here. Vanderwilly. Here. Heidemann. Bowers. Here. And uh, I know who's all not here. Okay. Ed, Ed. What, are you, what are you putting down for Gish? Ed's here. No, no, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Ed. Oh, Ed made it. Sorry, Ed. <laughs> Who wants to vote for Gish? I'm excused. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Did he call Second. you? Second. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah no, nobody called me. Okay. Um, well, let's stand at the Pledge of Allegiance. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, I'd like a motion for approval. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't sorry. mean to steal your thunder. That's okay. okay. So moved. Second. So, all right. Uh, any discussion? So Gene will be on top of the fire tower. Yeah. <laughs> I guess last one here. Last one last here. Last one here. <laughs> That's to go on my privilege. <laughs> um, motion and a second. Uh, on the discussion, no, no, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, okay. Uh, Chief Herman, is he? Oh, there you are. Okay. He had asked for this presentation in our last um, committee, the whole meeting, but we did have too many other things on the agenda. And I think the nature of this uh, meeting has, stands by itself. Uh, this will be it. This, we won't be taking any other topics other than this fire demonstration. So I guess we have to be inside and outside, right? Yeah, inside okay. and outside. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson Clayunas, uh, members of the committee of the whole, uh, members of the media, and guests. Welcome to our headquarters fire station. Uh, I'm not going to speak a whole lot tonight. We have a lot to get through. Uh, the reason that we put this together is uh, we wanted to show you what we do, how we do it, and how many people it actually takes to accomplish those, those things. In the fire service, um, we're really based on risk management. And we do a, spend a lot of time uh, charting how many times we get multiple calls at once, how big our responses are, how big the buildings are we respond to, how big the fires are. And really the city has decided that they have funded their fire department to handle residential fires. We can handle a fire in a ranch home or a two-story home very well with the manpower that we have. As you saw at the fire last Saturday night on A Street, that really taxes our resources and we need to call help from the volunteers to help us contain those. Uh, and when you look at risk management, if you look at a fire like a landmark fire, Prangies, Stone A, those happen every eight to 10 years. There's no way that a city our size could fund a fire department to have the resources to put those fires out. You'd have to have 100 firefighters on duty every day and it just doesn't make sense. So that's why um, our department is sized the way we are and the normal fire we have is a residential fire. Uh, tonight's scenario that we're going to present to you really um, utilizes all the resources that we have on duty during the day and that is at the staffing level that we were at last year. The reason we're still at that staffing level being six people short is right now we don't have anybody on vacation during these periods of the year. Once April or May comes, um, the people that you're going to see respond to this fire this exercise out here tonight will be too short because once we start having vacations, those people just aren't going to be here. That's why it's important that I... Chief, how many, how many firefighters do you have now? You have Actual men work. Actual men on the rigs we have right now have 63. So divided by uh, three shifts, that's 21 a shift. We allow four people out on vacation at a time. So that drops us down to 17 for more than half of the year when people are on vacation. The exercise that we're going to perform for you tonight, we'll, we will be utilizing every station, which is typical to the way we would respond to a, uh, a house fire. The Southside 18th Street Station has a fire engine with two people on it, an officer and a driver, and a med unit with two firefighter paramedics. The Downtown Fire Station has a pumper and a rescue truck. They both have an officer on it and a driver. The Northside Fire Station on 15th and Main has a fire engine with an officer and a driver, 
and a med unit with two firefighter paramedics. And the station that we are at here has a ladder truck with two fire, uh, an officer and a driver, and a med unit with two firefighters. The new station on South 18th Street has a fire engine with two firefighters on it. During our exercise, which would be normal for us, that unit will relocate to Station 1, because that is going to be the only unit that is left in service once we deploy all of the other um, units for the exercise. So we will put him central um, in case another call comes in, and that would be the only unit left to respond to that. What we have set up as an exercise tonight will be um, something that would occur at 2 a.m. in the morning, which is very typical for our residential fires. Um, it's set up that a neighbor has just arrived home from work. He sees smoke coming from his neighbor's home on the second floor, and the res residence is located on 25th Street here. And that mail party, uh, he knows that a mail party lives upstairs, but he doesn't know if he's home, his car is outside. So then that neighbor does place that 911 telephone call. To that call, we will have 15 firefighting personnel uh, respond, 14 firefighters and one shift commander. The people that you're going to see outside with yellow helmets on are the captains and lieutenants that are normally on the fire rigs. The, the firefighters with the orange and yellow traffic vests are going to be your firefighter paramedics that are on the rigs or on the fire on the ambulances. And it's uh, important to remember that all firefighting crews always work in twos. Nobody ever works by themselves. And that's set up so that you have a partner that always knows where you are. Um, if this was a real incident, we would re be responding here with eight vehicles. Um, for tonight's exercise, we're only going to have five because I had to leave the, the crews in the station. Um, all the people that are putting this exercise on for you tonight volunteered for this, and they are all, are all off-duty people. In any fire that we go to, um, our priorities are the same, and they're in the same order, whether it's a uh, business, <laughs> factory, or a residence. First thing we, we are concerned with is rescue. Is anybody inside? Our second uh, is exposures. We're going to make sure that wherever the fire is, it doesn't spread to more of the building it's in or to buildings next door. The third thing is we want to confine the fire to where it is, uh, and we want to extinguish it there. And then after that is overhaul, which means we're not trying not to damage any more of the building than is already involved. And then as we go through, we're also salvaging the people's um, private property or the rest of their the, uh, building. And then we also need to do ventilation, which is very critical. While you're outside tonight, um, there will be firefighters standing amongst you with radios on. So if you have any questions on what's going on, you're going to hear the actual radio transmissions of what we're doing. So if you have any questions of them of what they're doing, uh, feel free to ask them. Uh, we're going to show you a quick film here first before we go out. It's, it's a little bit of an old film. Um, we've been showing it in, in the schools for probably the last 20 to 25 years, but it's still very pertinent to how fires start um, how fast they progress, what they look like when we actually arrive on scene. And I know a lot of times when we talk, I always say that fires double in size every two minutes. You're going to be able to see that in this film um, very evidently. You're going to see the visibility that we are accustomed to working in when we pull up to a fire. Um, and it's going to talk about the heat that we're working in and why it's so important to have somebody ventilating the building um, as we're trying to get in. Breathing inside this building uh, would be impossible because of the heat and the gases. And as the, the exercise we're going to put on for you tonight, we're going to use theatrical smoke, but there will be real smoke out there. And if all our cameras and everything work, you'll be able to see what the firefighters are seeing as they're crawling through. Um, we have not told the firefighters of exactly what they're going to find tonight, just like it would be in a regular house fire. They do know they're pulling up to a two-story building that has a fire on the second floor. Other than that, they do not know anything else. So we'll run the film for you quick, and then uh, we'll proceed to the outside for our exercise. <coughs> yeah, the images he talked about with the uh, camera are actual images broadcast from their thermal imaging camera that the initial attack crew was carrying. So you'll be able to see what they see when they look through their camera. It'll look like it's wide open, but it's actually the visibility is zero in there. In a, in a typical residential fire, what is your response time from the moment you get the call here? 
do you have? It's very, it's very parallel to the ambulance response, about three minutes. Do you get until we get a first unit? Everything we do outside is going to be our normal response times. You're going to see, we're going to place a 911 call, which is going to take about 30 seconds. You're going to hear the dispatcher for about 30 seconds dispatching us. Takes us maybe another half a minute to get into the fire truck and go. And then we're going to use a three minute response time for the first arriving unit. And then after that, it's typically about a minute or two minutes as the, the remaining units arrive on scene. Everything will be in real time outside, so you're going to see how, how, that actually, how long that actually takes. But the film actually shows you of how that fire has grown from the time it started to the 911 call is placed, if it is placed timely, until we get there and what we see when we get inside. power can do to a home. A carelessly discarded cigarette is the cause of this fire, but home fires can start many ways. Space heaters, wood stoves, faulty electrical equipment, and cooking, among others. there is a longer period of time from the appearance of smoke to actual flames. Remember, what you will see and hear was filmed as it actually happened. <coughs> this would be very typical to how we believe the fire on A Street started. 30 seconds from first flame. The sofa ignites. From this point, fire grows rapidly. If you discover a fire, leave immediately and call the fire department from a neighbor's house. Polyurethane cushioning from the couch starts to melt, spreading fire to the rug. Smoke begins to fill the room. One minute, 23 seconds. The stairway to upstairs, still clear. Things look safe here in the kids' room, but downstairs the fire continues to accelerate. One minute, 35 seconds. The smoke layer in the living room descends rapidly. Gases flowing out of this room now exceed 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Seven seconds. Light smoke begins to move to the second floor. One minute, 50 seconds. The smoke detector at the foot of the stairs sounds an alarm, providing warning before exits are blocked. We would open a Take best case scenario, scenario now the 911 call is being the air is clean. <laughs> Two minutes, 30 seconds. The temperature above the couch is now 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's over 200 degrees Celsius. Two minutes, 48 seconds. Smoke pours into the dining room. Now only four feet above the floor. Thick black smoke moves rapidly upstairs. Three minutes, three seconds. Melted polyurethane burns under the couch. Suddenly the lampshade ignites. The temperature three feet above the floor in this room is over 500 degrees Fahrenheit. No one could survive. Three minutes, 20 seconds. The upstairs hall is beginning to fill with black acrid smoke. 
making escape more difficult. From the outside, there may be no evidence of the inferno inside. Three minutes, 41 seconds. The energy in the room suddenly ignites everything. Within one minute, the temperature has risen to over 1,400 degrees. Flash over. The living room windows break out. The entire room fills with flames, forcing huge amounts of smoke and toxic gases throughout the house. Only two minutes after the smoke detector sounded, the lower hallway is dark and filled with smoke. So the upstairs by this hall point, we're on our way now out. passable. A second escape route is your only way out. Four minutes, 33 seconds. Only now are flames visible from outside the house. If this fire occurred at night when most fatal fires happen, this would be the first exterior evidence of fire in progress. Flames climb up the outside of the house, entering the guest room window. Fire grows so fast that the fire department may not be able to rescue anyone trapped inside. Firefighters wearing protective clothing enter to search the house and to combat the fire. Control the fire, causing steam to pour out of the first floor. Reaching the second floor, firefighters break windows to release heat and vent smoke. They open walls to check for fire spread. Not all fires behave like this one. Some will move slower, some faster. But if a fire starts in your home, get out immediately and stay out. You have just seen the power of an uncontrolled fire. If there are not any questions, um, we'll proceed outside and minus the actual <coughs> fire, we'll show you what what it takes to put that out. Yeah. Typically what kills the people? Is it's typically the smoke and the, the heated gases. It's not the flames. Yeah. Very seldom is it the actual flames. Leach? Chief, I, I have a good question. Is that 14 degrees, does that make that building very susceptible to collapsing in at 1400 degrees? I saw some of the firemen running in. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question that is really becoming more and more relevant. In this style home, with the time period that you saw here, we're still okay. In the newer, lighter weight construction homes that we're dealing with now, and that's what killed the firefighter in Green Bay, uh, I think they were less than 15 minutes into the fire and they went through the floor. So the reason I'm asking that, sir, is this. The last night I just happened to be watching a, a, a Discovery Channel and they were investigating a 9-11 terrorist attack on the building. They, had a, they ran a test on the, the jet fuel and an I beam, iron the I beam, and it showed that this beam was supposedly up, go up to about 2,000. And at 14 degrees, uh, uh, 1,400 degrees, this thing started bending and all of a sudden it collapsed. They showed that's what happened to this building so that when they started to, that's the reason I'm asking this. Okay? And it's something that we deal with and it's something that the incident commander is timing as we're there, trying to figure out how long it has been since this fire started to when we're in there. And we know the construction of the homes in the cities. If you're in the in the middle of the city, we're not dealing with truss construction, which fails much quicker than a roof rafter. Um, if we have a solid 2x6, 2x8, 2x10 roof rafter, same on a floor joist, we've got pretty much time, 20 minutes, half hour before that is going to burn all the way through and collapse. If we're dealing with lightweight construction, it's much less than that. Thank and you. it's something we have to be aware of. Chief, do you find, you know, the, in the video it mentions, you know, the fire at that point was fairly small, but it still recommends get out, call the fire department. Do you find that a lot of people think that it's okay that they can try grab a, go grab a fire extinguisher rather than calling you right away and that kind of lengthens your response time because they're not making that call right away? That's a very typical occurrence. That's what we believe happened on A Street and it's something that we, we run into 
a lot. And a lot. obviously strongly uh, uh, we, oppose people yeah, doing we all And in the school programs, we always tell the kids, call 911 first from somewhere outside. Don't go back in and don't try to extinguish it yourself. Because nine times out of ten, they can't put it out. Um, after the demonstration is completed, um, we can come back up here if you have any other questions and ask them where to warm. Uh, as long as everybody is assembled, our firefighter Cal Hughes is going to place the 911 call to our actual dispatcher. She will dispatch it on one of our spare channels, and then from there we'll just be doing the talking without dispatch. This is the real one. Real. <laughs> that was quick. give her a couple Actually, seconds here to be busy yeah. for a few minutes um, and just make sure everybody's on channel three yeah channel three yeah, as soon as they go on route then call her okay, okay. Dispatch Metri's Copy Metri. how many seconds was that time of call till they got on the road Cal, go ahead and call. <laughs> Hi, this is the scenario. Okay, uh, I just came home and uh, there is a uh, there appears to be my neighbor's house appears to be on fire. It's uh, the, go ahead, what? Uh, 1326, it's the house behind 1326 North 25th Street. Uh, I don't know, I know that one person lives upstairs, but I'm not positive if, he, if, if he's home or not. Uh, my phone number? Okay I'll, okay, I'll try to see if I can get a hold of anybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Commander asked for additional units because it sounds like a working fire. Dispatch would have only sent two of our stations. This brings the other two for a four total. 
first two alarms. That's the second alarm coming in because it sounds like we have a working fire. 511 responding. So you can see there was about a minute's time there between the 911 call going in and her being able to dispatch. If you made the 911 call, this is horrible. It seems that. It does. It's just, but it only. You know, a minute or two goes by with yeah. them, it's short. When you're sure. yeah. Yeah. Ladder two is responding. Ladder two is responding. Ladder two is responding.
the stations know which ones are supposed to go. That's why she'll say an area, and then we know, we've pre-planned which stations go. But in a fire like this, where they hear it's actually, there's smoke visible, they're in the, getting into trucks and they're ready to go because they know they're, they're going to be getting, they'll get that second alarm where they know they're going to have to respond. Okay, so in this case, you had one victim. Scenario where you have two, three victims. I mean, in that scenario, you almost have to completely shut down fighting the fire. Correct. That's where we go back to number one, and we try to get them out as safely as we possibly can, and these don't matter until we get them out. How long does your first team of firefighters go in before you have to kind of alternate? There's got, there must be some sort of a time limit on that, huh? Our bottles are 40-minute bottles now, 45-minute 40, bottles now. Um, you know, they can normally go through that full tank before they come out. We used to have 20 minute bottles, they'd have to refill and go back. Mm -hmm. But after a 45 minute tank of air in that heat, you're, you pretty much gotta come out and sit for a minute. Yeah. There must be a buzzer then that goes off and lets them know. Uh, we do, it vibrates actually. Oh. When it tells you when you get the 500 pounds of pressure, it vibrates. Yeah. And that gives them about how much time? Uh, another 10 minutes roughly, right? Yeah. yeah you can tell who's not on the line anymore. Yeah. <laughs> So you can see uh, that yeah. original engine pulled up only had two people on it. Mm -hmm. The officer got out and walked around to see what was going on. That left the driver to pull that hose off. Mm -hmm. um, we still don't have enough people to go in until that next arriving unit comes. What happened Saturday night with the crowd scene? You got the bar unloaded outside of the street and you pull up with two fire firefighters. I guess I'll ask firefighter Longmiller who I was first on scene. We were first on scene and uh, I was on rescue one and we pull up with engine one, so there's four people who got there on two different rigs, two, two on engine one, two on rescue one. We pull up, um, officer on engine one, Captain Irish, was already starting to do, to do his size up. Myself and I'm a driver on rescue one. I'm trying to get off while my officer's running to the stairwell. There's people yelling at us that there's people possibly trapped. Why aren't we getting water on the fire yet? Why aren't we entering the building? And where is everybody else? And you've got four people. One person's trying to operate. One, uh, fire uh, FEO Ensley's pulling hose off, but he still has to get the pump into gear because it's so cold out. It's 10 degrees that night. Um, so you can imagine what's going on while my officer's trying to look up the stairwell to the smoke that's already banking down where the apartments are. And uh, yet we have all these people up in that night. I mean, just hit, you know, bar night. You had, geez, 30, 40 people already gathering on that corner watching us screaming, why aren't you doing anything? Yeah. But with National firefighting standards say that a firefighter does not have to go into a building. We go in in twos. Firefighters do not have to enter until the second twosome is there to pull them out. It's called our backup crew. They can go in on their own if they feel it's safe to perform a rescue. So it's a decision a firefighter has to make on scene if he does not have that backup line there behind him. Were there rescues that night? Well, myself and Lieutenant Kolbeck made it to the top of the stairwell. But by the time we made it to the top of the stairwell and started to traverse to go toward look for the fire, the, snow, the smoke had banked down so much and the heat was so intense that at that point, uh, if there was a rescue, it would have been, I mean, at that point, the amount of heat and smoke. So we started to back down. By that time, then, fire and flames were already over our head up there. But, you know, remember, there's only two of us up there, one guy, one guy at the engine who is controlling the water and our officer. So effectively, we didn't have anybody there yet to even rescue us or to back us up with more hoses. Which they should. would have gone through the floor when they got to the top. There was nobody there to, to pull them off. Speaking of the rescues, there was um, three bar patrons that went up. Um, the lady in the front apartment, the grandmother, had two children with her, a year, one and a half and a seven-year-old. And the bar patrons helped her down. They actually carried the child, one of the chil child, uh, the child, or the youngest child. They carried her down the steps. She just said she could feel the rail, but she couldn't see where she was going mm -hmm. at that point in the fire. But, but you had no idea that that was all the people around. No, yeah. Right? Once these guys go up, I mean, outside is chaos, and no one said anything that they got everyone out. Um, it, it's organized chaos for the first few minutes, and then you to find out how many are possibly up there. If there's a fire and there's a rescue of the people, but one of those people would say, uh, please rescue my pet, would you miss yourself or firefighters to rescue your pets? Um, 
you know, we wouldn't go in specially for that, but we've rescued many, many animals. Typically, animals do pretty good in a fire because they're low to the ground where the best air is. Um, so we pulled out many, many cats. Well, I can put a sticker on that says, don't, don't save yeah. the cat. Yeah, you can. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> I, I think it, it, you can kind of see why it takes everybody that we have on duty during the day to do what we have to do in that first 15 minutes, and that's really the most critical part. As we at, at this time of the fire now, we're kind of pulling back and looking for extension in other parts of the building. We don't have a rescue anymore. Um, we're trying to save as much property as we possibly can. Um, you know, if it's it's a fire that is out of control, we're just protecting the outside, like at Landmark, we're protecting everything else that's around it. It's really the first 15 minutes that we need everybody. Let's say it's an industrial setting. Sheboygan Paint, perfect example. I mean, you you don't know chemicals. It's and how do you get a hold of the experts that know what's in here? Well, we do know chemicals because we do inspections okay. in all these buildings. We have pre-plans. We have it written down. We have files that we can look at it. Um, a lot of those buildings have <clears throat> fire protection systems. A sprinkler system they'll have a connection that we can hook up to and once again it's the firefighters on scene that make that decision can we safely get in there hit that fire quickly and get it out or do we need to pull back and, and protect the exposures in terms of responding to a fire like you would stage tonight with um, you know general alarm knowing that there's visible smoke and uh, flames when a truck arrives and you can see do you just approach a situation as you know, worst case scenario and go from there? I mean, what's, you know, what's kind of the mindset when you show up? I mean, you, you just have to take it as it comes and assess the situation as you it's go? It's a lot of factors. You're thinking time of day. This, this scenario is 2 a.m., vehicle outside. You assume that somebody's probably inside there. Middle of the afternoon, there's less of a chance, but you never assume. So, yeah, we are always feeling, you know, worst case scenario, we're getting in there as quickly as we can. Our first thing, again, is... We have to get in there and see if anybody's inside. That's the first thing we determine on all floors of the building, and then it's extinguishment. Did you hear me? Reference to Alderman Hanna's question. What was the, can you go through that again? First you had one fire truck, two men, then another fire truck. At what point did the challenge uh, call when the ambulance were there? And how a typical, this, this fire in the city, we would have everybody deployed except um, one fire engine would be remain in one of the houses. And, and a lot of times if it is a bad fire, we'll still bring them to the scene, but keep them available. So the two firefighters on that vehicle maybe help setting up a ladder, maybe help just pulling the holes up through the door because a lot of times if we have to make turns, it's hooking. So we need somebody feeding that hose. So we can bring everybody to the scene, but leave people outside and leave them available for another call. Will you back that truck in? So it's, we would, it's backed in, we're facing out, nothing comes off of that vehicle. The people that are on that vehicle don't get dirty. Don't, they're, it's what we call clean work. They're outside, they maybe will make the hydrant, but they're doing something that the second call comes in, they gotta go. And typically all of our med units would be deployed to a fire like this, all three. We probably would commit two of those firefighter paramedics to a hose line, which was what was done here. And we would try to keep the other two med units outside doing clean work. That how many, how many firemen in, the, in this scenario we have deployed out? How many firemen are sitting here in this building? Right now? If, if four. There's four. Yeah. Yeah. There's four in every one of no, the no, stations. No, no, I meant if, if you were out on call, how many would be left in this building? <coughs> Anybody left they were at that fire chief. Yeah. There's nobody. 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 Typically, there would be nobody in any of their stations unless we left one rig central. We would move it downtown is what we try to do. If there are multiple fires in Shibori, for example, and other trucks are in use, is there any additional help to your car like Shibori you know, Falls, other town, for example? That that's what we did on A Street. Um, we called town of Sheboygan. Landmark fire, we called town of Sheboygan. Typically, Anything that's bigger than a residence, um, downtown, factory, anything, we need to call for help. Um, we can call in our off-duty people to come help us, um, but a lot of times we need more equipment. So that's that's when we'll call the town of Sheboygan or uh, town of Wilson. We've used coal or we, we've used City of Falls already. Um, and likewise, we've gone out and helped uh, town of Sheboygan numerous times. 
Tom Wilson numerous times. But yeah, it's a it's a pretty quick call, and I don't. Uh, do you remember how long it took them to get I there? I want to say it was 26, 30 minutes, something like it's, that. It's, it's typically easy. about 15, 20 minutes for them to get, once we make the call for them to get there, which is, that's not bad. When you no, offer their assistance, you're not, you're not, they're not involved in a rescue because the timeline. Right. They won't be in a rescue, probably not even an offensive attack where you're trying to put it out. It's when it's surround and drown. That's that's when the, you call for that. We're at the, the it's typically at the when we're trying to make sure this doesn't go somewhere else. So right. one you are, they aren't going to be involved in the rescues or right. even putting it out without it's, excessive damage. It's too late they're, by they're there. Yeah. Once it's it it. They're there. Our surrounding communities all respond, just like we would respond to their advice. Correct. In an emergency, everybody go to the church. We, we have what's called mutual aid packs with all our surrounding communities, okay. and uh, there's there's no charge. But, you know, we call them, they call us, we go. Um, you know, uh, I think at the landmark fire, we melted off some of the lenses on town of Sheboygan and we paid to replace those, but uh, yeah. it's just a mutual aid agreement. We help them, they help us. But in terms of, because of your size and personnel and more equipment you have, just being a bigger city, do they rely more on the city than you, know, you relying on town of Sheboygan, for instance? Um, or is it just because they don't have as many incidents? It's just I, not, it I think come that's up. because they don't have as many calls as what we do. Um, it's it's about half and half. It balances out. Yeah, it balances out. But I would say as we as we go into the future here and everything becomes more and more costly, it doesn't make sense for all of us to have a hundred foot aerial ladder. Mm -hmm. um, the the political parties at B are going to need to meet in the in the future and, and combine us, and we need to share more and more resources to make this work. Yeah. What are some of the unique pieces of equipment that that some of the surrounding communities have that you don't have? Are, are there pieces that you had to use on Saturday? There's brush buggies. No, not yeah, on there's, Saturday. There's yeah. tanker trucks. Tanker. Um, brush buggies, grass fires. If we have yeah. something evergreen, we maybe have to call them. They do have a platform um, in the town of Sheboygan, which has the, the large platform on the end of the vehicle that we do not have. And there's times where that's advantageous. You can reach out in the river, dip it down, and, and put people right in and lift them up with it. So they have some some items, but not, but not a lot. And we do have the Jaws of Life where Town of Wilson does not. So we have an agreement where we cover up to Highway B for them. And we do have a confined space rescue equipment that we cover the entire county with. Nobody else has that equipment. Some of the trench rescue yeah. things we have, um, specialty rescue equipment that we got the grant on. City of Falls actually has confined space, but they actually just called us the other day because they're having the same problem because Tech Rescue involves so many people and so much training and so much competency uh, review that they're having problems getting people like during the day. And so they called us actually just this last week and said, hey, we want to get together with you, hook up our, our people that we have, see what you guys have, see what we have. And we're, we're constantly working on interoperability stuff because it's going to happen more and more. And so we're doing a lot more joint training and, and they're really calling us a lot saying, hey, let's get together. That's what I was going to ask about. Did, tell, tell us about the training. I mean, you guys are <coughs> training on that stuff all the time, aren't you? Pretty much. Um, all day long today, they were down in the marina doing ice rescue training. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. it's, and on we're doing it constantly. Your, it's kind, right, constant. A great deal of the training we do is actually mandated. In fact, you know, you talk about all our operations. <laughs> we don't just make this stuff up. We try to run the minimum on a lot of it in some ways, but so much of it is mandated by law. You talk about the two in, two out thing. That's all OSHA respiratory protection standards and laws that we have to meet. I mean, it's not it's not a question of whether you think it's a good idea or not. Like some standards, you don't have any choice. COM 30 in the state of Wisconsin uh, and the OSHA respiratory protection laws and all of the worker safety laws and everything, especially in the fire service, it, it drives a great deal of what we do, and that's why we have to do it. And training is an enormous part of that. We have to do annual refresher training on all our EMS. We have to do annual training on, on uh, confined space, tech rescue, we have to do uh, SCVA training and respiratory use and all of the firefighter safety stuff is on a recurring basis. So that's just the stuff that we have to do every year. You know, and now you try to fill in some of the holes of the things that would be nice to get to. Um, and it, it, it's a tremendous amount of things. Because, you know, you, we, we train because it's not always learning something new. A lot of it is just repetition that when you have to do it, you get it right the first time. It's not unlike the military. They just do things over and over and over again. So when you have to do it in a panic, it just comes natural to you. It's more of a... Well, and we're constantly bringing in new employees, so we have to, it's a revolving training. Some, uh, radio for your hey, can you just, oh. 
Now, on the street where there's a where uh, the hydrant, where there's a tree for the house, for hook up for the trucks. If you hook up like three trucks up to the water hydrant, do, you, do the truck have enough water pump in it? Um, typically, we'll have to hook to more than one hydrant, and we have to know if they're all on the same line because that becomes a problem for us. But uh, that's probably one of the best things that Sheboygan has going for it is a very good water supply. Um, we do have some problems down in the east, older area of town where some of the water mains are, are smaller and older. But uh, that's the best thing that we have going for us is a good water supply and the location of our fire stations being that we have quick response times. One more thing, Chief. Yeah. I, I did notice that uh, you get a lot of misconception that now that we have a paramedic system and the uh, ambulance service, you know, that those are separate. But uh, people have to get their firemen first, paramedic second. Am I correct? Correct. All right, sir. That's the reason when you see this kind of a, a thing, it's very impressive to see a teamwork type of thing. What? Nobody runs into a building. Everybody, we got a set routine that you have to do. No, by four. We don't want to add to the tragedy. We want to. We want to solve the problem, right? And on a scenario like this, like I said, we try to keep two of our med units outside doing clean work so they can respond. What typically will happen is we'll automatically call two of our med medics back into work that are off duty to man our spare ambulance just to get that extra med unit out there because we're using our, our paramedics as Thank you. fire Well, just like tonight. Exactly like tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, way, the same thing. The slip and you know? fall at Shopka. I mean, this was very typical of having a house fire in a, and we had a med call at the same time, so it reduces what you have left. Chief, in terms of now this fire is over, you're packing up, you're getting back and, you know, kind of resetting everything, how long does it take to put, you know, the, the truck back into service? Like we're looking here, um, that's one of the things that the shift commander does automatically. He's trying to get as many units back into service as he possibly can. And that probably is going to take, with, after the first half hour of this fire, we'll start doing that. Um, and then we'll always leave probably two units here that are going to be tied up for, on a fire like this, it's probably going to be two to three hours. Is that just watching the, for hot spots, you know? Yep. Yeah, you know, we have to get into the attic. We have to start opening up walls. Um, we got to make sure that it's out. Um, so, you know, within a half hour, and then we call the fire investigator, but within a half hour, we're on something like this, we're trying to get units back into service again, and as quickly as we can, we got to get them back to the firehouse because if they use hose, we have to reload hose onto the fire truck. So that's one of the the first things that after we go through all this, that's the next thing in line is we got to get these units back in service in case we get another call. They typically don't pull lines off of every fire apparatus yeah. there mm -hmm. intentionally to have other units ready just in case something mm -hmm. else happens. So but usually if you need it. It's one or two units they'll pull the hose from, and then the remaining units will be intact, generally intact. And once we've made that initial attack, we need to fill our air bottles again. So it's, you know, we, we're no good without any air, so we need to get those refilled. That's another concern. Chief, can you just reiterate to me again, you know, about the importance of having the manpower uh, on our fire department simply because of the two guys going out on a rig, it, it just, you know, they're waiting for that additional manpower. And well, it's actually twofold in that, the, you know, and I don't, I don't like to say that we're running two people on a rig even though we're one of the only cities that, in the state that does it that way because I view our... We have two people on an engine, we have two people on a med unit, and they are, in most times, going out together Sometimes. and working as a four-person crew. Mm -hmm. Unless they're out on another med call, um, I view them as a four-person crew. They're just coming on separate vehicles. Before we had the ambulance, there were three people on that engine at all times. We never let it go down before below three because it was not a good working crew. Um, so that's very important that we have two people at all times, in addition to that driver on that on that vehicle working and being able to pull a hose line, because one person cannot pull a fire hose loaded with water. It's just impossible. And if you add ice and everything else into the equation, you just can't do it. And the other part of that equation is the total number of people that you get on the scene. Like tonight, our scenario, we had 15 people there. Um, that, the way we are staffed now, that allowed us to leave a fire engine in the firehouse with two on. If we don't hire these, the six that we lost, we'll, that 15 people will be everybody that we have in the entire city. And it really nobody starts left. to break down when vacations kick right. in. Yeah. 
that is one which is two thirds of the year when I have to allow four people out on vacation, that will be everything that we have, what you saw tonight. And there's nothing left for anything else. Where we were before, we were sort of doing a, a pretty monumental task of managing risk and moving people well, around. Tonight you would have been control. able to operate on four or five victims tops. I would oh, say that would have been a disaster. I would say yeah, two experience. would have been a real really stretch. Okay. If you put more than two, uh, we would there would have been problems. Our issue starts yeah. to become depth. Yeah. When things get beyond like this, or if another incident comes in, which is very common, or another med call, or anything that goes on in the city, or if we get something that is large geographically, like the flood, like a tornado, like even a thunderstorm. We got our rigs taxed. Chased but in, over the I mean, it, as I said in the beginning, it's risk management, and we are set up to handle this fire with the amount of people that we have. Because we have charted how many times we get two fires at once. It happens. It's not a lot of times. We, we've charted how many times we get a med call and a fire call at the same time. That happens more frequently. But we are set up to handle this type of fire. Anything bigger, we need help. The other question I have, and this, again, I, I want to touch on that firefighter paramedic thing because I guess it just bothers me. Firefighter paramedic. A firefighter is a paramedic, pretty much. I, I mean, the new people coming in, don't they have that training already? I guess and, I have to say it the other way around. A paramedic is a firefighter. Okay. A for, paramed everybody, okay. for everybody that we hire now, for everybody we hire that, paramedics that are firefighters. That are firefighters. So that, I mean, you, I, I don't think, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, that you hire somebody with that training already, correct? Correct. That's okay. the only way we let's, hire people. That's the only way you hire people. Ten years down the road, when you have turnover, you, you, you've got some firemen that are not paramedics now. But ten years down the road, that probably won't be the case. Ten years, yeah. And every, that's the way, every fireman that's the, way the system was them. set up, that as we go through this, in 30 years from now, everybody here will be a paramedic. It's, and... You know, now we have, where you saw the scenario tonight, they brought the victim down the steps and we need to get our paramedics there to do the advanced treatment on them and then to transport. 30 years from now, everybody's a paramedic. Everybody can do the same seconds. skills. Yeah. Or, yeah, whatever. Yeah, so 10 years from now, half of the department will be paramedics or more. Probably. It's becoming the standard for an emergency responder to have paramedic training, hazardous materials training, tech rescue training, firefighting training. And it's not unlike the military and their approach to things. Anybody that goes in the military, even if they're going to become an Air Force jet mechanic, first thing they do is they go to boot camp and they learn how to be a rifleman. Yeah. And during the time that they're in a readiness state as a rifleman, as an army or a military force, for when the time comes and they have to react quickly, mm -hmm. they're doing other things like the mechanic part, the fixing things. They have all their duties within that organization that makes them be there, but they're rifleman first. And that's a lot like the fire service approaches it. Everybody is a firefighter. They're all trained to be firefighters. But in the course of being in that readiness state, there's all kinds of other jobs that we can do that are helpful and needed in the community and to maintain our own service that we also perform at the same time. Uh, but unfortunately, they need to be on the duty when the thing happens because it happens quick and we have to be there right now. And everybody out there is doing multiple duties. We didn't just have one person stand by the hydrant and that's all he did. I mean, he had to stand there until he had the hose hooked up and the, and the man on the fire engine said, we need water, turns it on. Then he may be the one that goes and shuts the utilities off for us. Or he may be the one that goes and spreads the salvage covers over the personal belongings. So everybody is doing multiple, multiple tasks. Uh, but at the core of it is we need people to advance holes. We need people to do ventilation. We need people to set up ladders because without, without all the things that we do, we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And it's all tied together. As, as I walk around and talk to, to neighbors, it, a lot of us don't, still don't realize that you're 24-7. And that you're running, you know, three full crews a day. I mean, that just doesn't dawn on people, you know, when they see what of what's going on. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. This is great. Yeah, Donna, really, really, thank you for your attendance. I hope uh, we were informational. And but what if what if it, what if a uh, fire station closed? I mean, that, is that off the table now? Is that that was tossed about the fire station. I think that's still out there because yeah. we haven't had our people replaced, so yeah, I would say okay. that that so is still out yeah, there. I, I just, you know, I was wondering because it hasn't been talked about recently, and I haven't seen any documentation from any committees, so.
if we don't hire any additional people by the end of, or have them trained by the end of April when my vacation started in May, we have to close something because I don't have anybody to put in there. Are you going to give the same, um, go over the same scenarios at the finance meeting that you did at salary agreements when we, uh, you know, we, were, we had those, is that, is, are you going to do anything different than that? Um, I, I, I appreciate it. That was very important for me. And I recommend any of them that wanted to see that. Yes. I haven't been given a request to do anything to finance yet. I, I'm assuming that's coming up. Right. Um, I think that that's very important. What I so presented so at so the salary so agreements. Yeah. Have you made that? Um, have you made that presentation in public protection safety? No. no. Consider no. you on the agenda. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're really going to get the first. That, that was a request that I think Alderman Gisha had given to me a number of weeks ago mm -hmm. to present some options mm -hmm. as we move into this year. I um, wish you had. I really wish you would have had more time. Yeah. yeah. Last question. If one fire station should be closed, finally, which one would be the best to close? You don't have the map anymore. Should I walk down the or my map on the table? Um, <laughs> can somebody run down and get my paper when it's on my table in my office? It's in your office. Yeah, it's on the table. It's laying here. Um, yeah. It's a tricky question. Right in the middle of the city here is where the majority of all our calls are because these are the older buildings, um, more densely populated. And I've said this before, that I believe we can run this city with four fire stations very effectively and have decent response times. The problem is these two here are not in the right place. If I close this fire station, this is a long response time to some of these northeast neighborhoods here. Mm -hmm. uh, if we close this fire station, this is a very long response time out to the, the northwest and the western area. The ideal thing would be to close both these and have one right in the middle, but obviously in today's economic uh, times that's not a good option. This new fire station number five, our newest one, has the least amount of calls. So you would think that would be the one that I would recommend to close. But this is a very, very long response time. We've run some of these. They're like 10 minutes Where's over the train to, the, to the southeast. The train is right here. Mm -hmm. And I happen to live right on that tracks. And I can tell you it comes by a lot. And I've timed it. It's about four minutes of time. Mm -hmm. And I've also, time, I've also gone around it and timed it, it takes three minutes to get around it, whether you go east or west, if the train is there. It's not so much my concern of if we close this one, the response time for this, for station two to get here, what I'm concerned about is, is this station is out on a call, the next station's gotta come from one, here or here, and that is 10 to 12 to 15 minutes, like the trailer parks. So if you're asking me today, my recommendation would be if I had to close the station, I'd close the downtown one because we can converge onto this area. So. Chief, though, when you say you want to, that you could run the city with four stations, I do believe we want to still have the people in those stations. I'd still need the same amount of people it's not because as, we, people. as we saw tonight, that's the amount of people we need to put that fire out. I'm just saying that we could probably save money by not paying utilities and everything else. And There's some operational costs. Operational costs. But in terms of manpower, closing the station doesn't it's solve our issue. It doesn't solve right. the issue, correct. Hey, Chief Herman, I'm just going to ask the question. You need three more firemen. Can you need three more firemen, paramedic firemen. If you took the four firemen paramedics from the ambulance and we gave up the ambulance, you'd have your four firemen and we would not need to close the station. Correct. But you'd have to come up with about $630,000 that I'm giving you from the ambulance service to, that's going into the general fund. But you are correct. We'd be short. Our, I mean, our firefighting capabilities would be reduced because we'd have four less firefighters, but we would not have to close the station. That's correct. We'd come up with a deficit in our general fund. You'd have a deficit of 600000 
600. 600. If you take away the four wages that it's paying for and the 400,000 that we're putting in, it's roughly 630,000. And if you calculate if you close one station, keep the same amount of firefighters, just keep the close one per month with the city safe. About $35,000 in utilities, and then if you can sell the building? About half a man. Yeah. Okay. And Alderman Cobb, I believe it's not three, We need it's six to bring us back to whole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's three that you need for a fire station possibility. Mm -hmm. I, need, I need the rescue pumper and three. Mm -hmm. Or I need six. It's one of the two options, which is what I presented at the right. salary increments. Yeah. Chief, I, uh, two questions I have for you. One is because we have a utility uh, at the uh, Todd Wilson and Schweigen Water Lane, given with that, uh, does this also require fire police protection because of that unit being there? Uh, when you start talking about closing now a station. Okay, that's one, that's one, one of my questions. Uh, my second one was, is when we offer the early retirement to some of our city personnel to free up some money for the new hires to come in at overpaid, was this part of this agreement that, for the early retirement plan? We didn't have an early retirement plan. You didn't have an early retirement in your no. okay. Oh, the police department. Police department. Yeah, yeah right. we, didn't, we didn't. At the first part of your question, I didn't understand. Uh, you, because uh, LA, oh, you, because you, of LA? Right, right. Because this is it's a public utility, you know, that, that um, gets the federal government involved in this thing, which requires that you have X number of, you know, police protection, fire department, uh, you know. I, I don't know how to honestly answer that. We do respond there. It's not frequently. Um, I think where we're at, we're, or, you know, we're fine for covering that. I came up not too long ago in a news, in a news yeah. uh, survey. Okay, so to, one more time. It, it, if if the ambulance goes away, there's a six hundred thousand dollar net shortfall to the general fund. Um, and the four people go with it because that's four part people. of exactly. the six hundred thousand is funding those right. four people. Exactly. Correct. So then that goes with it. If we have this hiring these extra people, where in the budget is this money? Where you know we have a hiring freeze, and uh, the budget was passed. Where in the budget would this extra money come uh, from? Well, I know the firefighting unit, uh, union gave concessions of a two percent, which was about eighty-eight thousand. Um, where that was put into the budget, I don't know. Um, there were also some other concessions in the contract, but it is I can it's not in my firefighting budget. Uh, Alderman Gisha did say it's in the it's in the city budget, but where that is, I can't tell you. Okay. I'm just caution people too, on Alderman Klein, when we say extra, we're not talking about extra firefighters here. We're just talking about replacing firefighters, not extras. No no extras here, just replacing what we already currently were at. But as I think if the budget is set up, and they're, they're not there at the beginning of the budget year. They're not there. That's true. Right. And that's what we're asking for, to put them in, which means that hey, we have to change the budget. Right. Right. Correct. We have to find the money. You're in. both right. Yeah. He's, he's mm -hmm. saying it's, it's yeah. seven folks retired, and mm -hmm. they need six firefighters. And you're absolutely correct. The it's budget was set up without them. Yeah. That's, that's way what you're right. Well, right. See, that's why he just paid the big bucks. My understanding from salary and grievance was that we just made a motion to lift the hiring freeze and then that would be sent to finance for them to, to work out the... It still needs to be funded. It still needs to be funded. It still needs to be funded. That's what we talked about the other night. Exactly. And, and my point the other night was, if you're talking about the three, let's talk about what's really necessary at the same time. If, if you're going to have that dialogue, uh, if, if three only gets us part way there, let's talk about this six right. and let's see where the money is. Exactly. Right. <clears throat> if we only if, if a fire station saves us thirty-five grand, <laughs> and you can't, you can't. I don't think it's a big market for resale of fire stations right now. No. But we'll give, wait, wait, wait. we could probably give you the list. No, we can't we give you the list. <laughs> If you, if you only hire three, um, this vehicle goes goes down for one 
person for more than half the year, and I, I can't so operate, I can't one operate with one it's person. It's a brownout for that. Yeah. It's very if you live out there, man, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't like that so much. Yeah, but what, you know, mm -mm. Your, your folks are going to out there, ultimately, with a, with a train, you could run into eight, nine minute response times. Right. Very easily. And, that's, and as yeah. you saw on the, on the film, where was, where was that fire at nine minutes? Yeah. It's we all, were already it's there all, at it, nine minutes and shooting. putting it out. Yeah. Right. If, if we're not there at nine minutes, yeah. And there's We're another couple, the and there's a little couple minutes setting up once you get there, so you're 11, 12 minutes. Um, if, if we're there at 11, 12, 12 minutes, that house is burning down. Mm -hmm. right. Aside from the fact that it's, there's a large number of trailer parks down there, and those trailers are just down. Right. Yeah, you don't even have, you don't have a shot. Yeah. I mean, that's and our chance of saving a life yeah. is, yeah. is yeah. very limited, yeah. if not at all. No, aside from the obvious financial question of excising the ambulance out of the fire department now, <coughs> it doesn't even begin to talk about the quality. Mm -hmm. The quality of the speed, the continuity of oh, the system. I mean, it's every every right report now. you've delivered to me, the response mm -hmm. time is for the ambulance. And it's only going to get better. So right. going and and as you saw here, as we brought a victim out, now the same people that took that person right away, the firefighters that are treating them are taking them all the way to the hospital, and if he needs to be transported to Milwaukee, hope the same people that have had this person from the time we got him have him. So there's no chance for uh, miscommunication of information in between, um, and, and that's important on all medical calls. Thank you, Chief. We appreciate all the information. Thanks. You do Thank you for coming. Care picture. Yes. Thanks. And I will get you on the public relations <laughs> safety agenda for Great. Is that going to be something? And look, the two, no tie required. I don't wear them. The last time I wore them, I them. Move from the drug. Second. Thank you.